uh, Friday class is always seems to fall on such nice days. <laughs> okay. But uh, and and to make it even worse, today's class is going to be pretty intense <laughs> in terms of some mathematics and some concepts. So I put it right at the beginning here so we can get it over with and then look at applications for the rest of the day. So I said, yeah, we're going to look at this very first step here. It's combining about combining several data sets from a variety of sources. So this is called multi-block data analysis. Um, and then we're going to come back to batch monitoring after, after multi-block. Uh, and I'm going to end off the class with a case study that combines batch process monitoring with multi-block data uh, methods. So, so uh, that's the reason why I left batch monitoring out early on. We're coming back to it uh, in today's class in the last bit. Um, this part about alignment, I will, I will uh, come back when I go over the batch case study at that point. But, so I'm going to jump ahead a couple of slides. So we'll come back to um, these alignment slides at the end of the class. I'm just going to start here by the talk. So the main concept of multi-block methods is that we want to divide our variables up into subgroups. Uh, one thing that often happens, especially with large data sets, and we're talking about the column dimension here today, right? So it's not the row dimension that's large, it's the column dimension. The large number of variables in our data set can be overwhelming sometimes. If you're looking at a loading plot, P1 versus P2, or you're looking at W star, uh, C plots, and you've got just many, many data points on that plot, it's pretty overwhelming. Uh, the petrochemical data sets where you've got about 100, 200 columns, uh, those are particularly daunting. So one thing we want to do is to break those up into smaller groups for ease of understanding, ease of interpretation. And then also, as I'll show you in the end, we can actually get some uh, improved monitoring from, from that case we we'll break it up as we're going to show. So the main aim is we'd like to better understand the relationships among several groups of data sets. So this topic is also sometimes called data fusion. We're taking data from a variety of sources and we're trying to combine it or fuse it together in some way to better understand what's going on in the data set. And there'll be, there'll be some examples as we go through about what could be those, uh, those different blocks. Just to put it in perspective of uh, the, the history here, uh, Wald first mentioned this topic in this conference paper. That paper is on the literature website. You can't find it anywhere else. I happen to have a scanned copy from someone else or someone else, so it's pretty hard to get to. But you've got it there on the website. Uh, then McGregor and a few uh, one of his PhD students and two others uh, discussed this concept in the context of fault detection process monitoring in an early article in ASCG. This paper over here is probably one of the most important papers because it shows the equivalence of ordinary PCA and PLS to multi-block PCA, multi-block uh, PCA and PLS. That should be MPP, multi-block PLS. Uh, then there was an, another interesting case study here by Joe Chin. And then a good overview is in this recent paper from 2003 as well. So those are worth reading as well as any of the other multi-block uh, papers tagged on the course website there. The most general case that we can see for multi-block data analysis is where we've got a single block x1 over here, and it's got k1 variables. We've got a second block, uh, and a third block, up to the, the a middle, some middle block x superscript b, up to our final block x capital B. So we've got capital B blocks, and each one of those blocks can have a different number of columns. The only thing in common is, is the row dimension. So it's the same observation carrying through from one block to the next. And on each of those object, observation on that object, we're measuring a certain group of variables in x1, a different group of variables in x2, uh, x3, up to x capital B. And then on that same observation, so also capital N observations in the y blocks, we can have a multiple number of y blocks, y1, y2, up to yq. But for this class today, and in general, general in the literature and even in the software, uh, people only deal with a single y block. But it's not hard to generalize this to multiple y blocks. So 
I will follow that same convention. We'll only consider a single y block in today's class, and then there's only uh, one consistent dimension along here, n capital N. So, for example, you could have your raw material properties in one block, and then on those raw materials, you may have taken some near infrared spectrum, and then that's a whole whack of columns over there, so you put that into a second block. Those raw materials then go into your batch reactor, which then continue on in the batch trajectories over a certain duration of time. And so there's another block of data, the batch trajectories over time. In fact, that's a 3D block, but I'm assuming we're unfolding it to a long, a long block like we showed last week, where we, we keep n rows, one per batch, and then the columns are our unfolded trajectories over time. So that could be another block. And then we could have measurements from other unit operations, the cooling water system around that batch, um, and other, other measurements that go into another block. So the consistency here in that example is that every row represents one batch, but the variables inside each block come from different parts of that batch system. Some are from the raw materials, the near infrared spectra, the other block is from how that batch evolves over time. And then finally, in our Y um, matrix, we have the corresponding lab values, one for each, one row for each batch. And again, as many columns as we get back from the lab. And there's no, nothing wrong with putting duplicate variables in different blocks. Okay. Uh, another example that you can add to your notes is if one takes a petrochemical uh, system plant, there's several unit operations that go in sequence. So we, we, we take our raw material, and that goes to a set of, of units, which then gets passed onto the next set of, of unit operations, distillation columns, and so on. And there may be another final set. And obviously inside there, this is a whole whack of complex process equipment and with recycled streams and all sorts. But if we just general, generally block it up into major sections in the plant, we can often decouple our process into these sorts of groups. And then we would take all the variables from that group as our X1, the variables from that, those unit operations into X2, and then another set of final unit operations, X3. And what I'm saying here with this last point is often the delineation between where one reactor ends and the other reactor takes up can overlap. So it's not, not, nothing wrong with putting the last few variables from this, um, these unit operations also in this block over here. Okay. So uh, that, that might, the reason for that can, can will become apparent later on as well, why, why one would do that. Okay, so that's just the general notation and, and the, the, the concept. And what I'm going to start with is this first case where you only have X blocks. So I'm going to ignore the multi-block uh, PLS case for now. We'll come back to that. Let's just take a look at multi-block uh, PCA. So what we'll do is we'll give each block its own scores, its own loadings, SPE values, T squared, weights, VIPs, R squared, all the usual uh, plots that we have from the single block case, where we just have a single X block. We're now going to generalize it to multiple X blocks. But we're going to add something interesting that's new here. We're going to add a super level, or it's called a super model. And this super model will summarize the sub models. So for each of these lower level model uh, blocks, we're going to have loadings and weights and scores and SPE values for, for this block, for that block, and the next block. But then we'd like to combine those scores and from the, from the lower blocks up to a super level block. So we're going to take the scores from this block, the scores from the next block, and so on. We're going to collect them all into a new block over here on the side, which I'm going to call the super level or the super model. And those, that super model is going to summarize the sub models or the lower level. So before we get to that point, though, one very crude way of, uh, of achieving this approach is just to push all your blocks together and build a single PCA model on this, okay? And what you then go do, because this is now many, many columns long, 
rather than plot a loading <coughs> plot, a loading plot with capital K columns, rather plot a loading <coughs> plot with K1 columns for this block, and then another loading plot for the next block, and so on. And also the R squared values. You can go look at the R squared values per column. So rather than go look at all at a, at a bar plot of all the R squared values over capital K columns, we just look at it over the smaller groups at a time. Okay, so that's very crude, very straightforward. It's not hard to make the soft, um, not hard to write software to do that if you if you did want it. But one issue there is that the block loadings won't be orthogonal. The block the, the entire loadings vector from P1 is orthogonal to P2, but taking subsections of this, arbitrary subsections, there's no orthogonality there, right? Um, those loadings are orthogonal when you use a complete one, but not arbitrary subsections. Also, you're just gonna land it with one set of scores, the ordinary PCA scores that you would normally have got. So those are, those are no different to before. And they just simply explain the entire X matrix. There's no way to tell, well, how much of, let's say, T1 in that column is due to the first block? And how much of the T2 is due to another block, right? There's no way to break down the contribution from each block to this super score. Okay? There's no way we can tell how much, which blocks are more important than the others, or which blocks have most influence on the scores. Okay. So, we're going to look at what's called consensus PCA. That's here in the next slide. But before we do that, um, and before we go look at the algorithm for consensus PCA, it's going to involve a lot of these arrows in today's class. So I just want to recap the concept of the Niepels algorithm for ordinary PCA with a single X block before we move on to the multiplot case. So recall Niepels algorithm takes a single X matrix and iterates between these two regressions. We start off by picking from column X any random column. It doesn't matter which one, as long as that column is non-zero. We take that column and that's our initial guess for the first score, T1. Then what we go do is we go take columns from X one at a time, so column X1, column X2, etc. And for each column, we treat that as our y variable in, in the regression. We're going to regress that column onto the score. The score value takes the role of the x variable in the regression. Okay. So where this arrow starts is our x variable. It passes through this particular column, which is our y variable. And the regression slope from that linear regression is stored then as the slope coefficient or the loading value corresponding to that column. Once we've accumulated all those values in, in the first loading, we then proceed to go back up again. We iterate back by regressing every row in X now onto that loading. So that row in X takes the role of the Y variable now in the linear regression. The loading takes the role of the X variable in the linear regression. And then the slope coefficient, when we regress that row from X onto the loading, gets stored into that position in the score, T1. So what, what ends up happening then, let's just come back to this first set of regression, assuming we've converged now to the final T, TA and the PA loading and score at the end of the Niepels algorithm, assume that we've converged now, what happens when this column from X is strongly correlated to this column T1? or T2, whichever that component is, if that particular column is strongly correlated with the, with the score, it's going to have a large loading over here. Similarly, a column from X that's not strongly correlated is going to have a, a pretty negligible or small slope coefficient, a small loading. So, um, so it's very, that's why we look at the loadings plot and look at the large values in the loadings to see which are the important variables in that component. Variables with small weights or small loadings mean that they don't play a significant role in calculating that particular score. Similar interpretation here for the rows from X, right? If we get a large T1 value, 
we can say, well, that's a large slope. By right? saying that we're getting a large slope when we regress that growth from X onto the loading. It indicates that whatever the variables are in the loadings here that have large weights, that those corresponding variables in the row from X also are large at that particular point in time. So that observation has a very strong correlation to that loading on, a, on an entry by entry basis in that regression. So that's why the corresponding slope out there in skull is, uh, is large. Or conversely, a row that has very little similarity to this loading pattern will get a low, a low uh, slope correlation for a small skull value and indicates it's not really um, similar to that particular direction. And then one other final thing that we, we haven't really mentioned before. If we take a look at this uh, regression and we treat this column here from x, remember that's, that column xk takes the role of the y variable in the regression, and that loading, uh, sorry, that score ta takes the role of the x variable in the regression. Then the corresponding entry p k a is the slope coefficient in the regression. So in our regression state, we would say y is equal to, y hat rather, is equal to e times x, okay, from a regression perspective. So our prediction of y is equal to the slope coefficient multiplied by a new x. Well, let's take a look at that in this notation over here. What we're saying, y is taking the role of xk, so it says xk hat is equal to e is the role of pka times x, the x role in this regression is given by ta. So x hat is tp transpose or pt, tp, it doesn't matter uh, which order we do it. But it's showing how we can get our best prediction back of x is equal to t times p. The slope given, um, sorry, the slope is pa. Multiply, what am I doing here, sorry? The slope is t. Pka, yeah. Times, times t. So we're predicting that column of x based, based on the scores. You can follow a similar line of reasoning, actually, by, by, with this regression here. So in this regression, our row from x is the y variable. We multiply that slope coefficient t by p, and that gets us x hat. So the reason why I'm looking at that is because we have to understand we we're getting x hat, and then in the next step, we're going to calculate residuals. E is x minus x hat. And those residuals are always orthogonal to the space that, that they originally came from. So in this case, the residuals E x minus x hat. Oh, because this is back to this notation. E is equal to y minus y hat. So over here, our residuals E is equal to y y in the regression role is taken by xk minus xk hat, okay? From these squares, we know our residuals e are orthogonal to y hat. I should write that again. So e is orthogonal to y hat. So back in our PCA notation, e is going to be orthogonal to x hat, okay? So, what we're removing, what we're going to subtract out, when we're subtracting out x hat, that residual, is going to be orthogonal to the next component. So the next component is going to be calculated on the deflated column x. So we, we call this action, when we subtract from x, we subtract x hat, this step is called deflation. We're deflating or removing out from the x column the part we can explain we can explain is x hat. We know also from these squares that those residuals are orthogonal to the predicted y's. So in other words, the residuals e are orthogonal to x hat, which enforces that when the next component comes along and gets calculated now on these residuals, they're going to be orthogonal to the previous component.
well. This is how orthogonality gets induced in PCA, or gets forced in, because of this deflation step. Okay. And the reason why I'm stressing this is, you have, what's critical is to understand what is being deflated. Here we're deflating from X the loadings corresponding to that X matrix times its score. In other words, P times T is the best explanation we have of X at this moment in time. We're going to deflate from X that best prediction. Okay. We're going to use this concept now in the next slide when we're, uh, when we're looking at consensus PCA and, and multi-block P. Anything on that just before I go on? Yes, sir. I just want to make sure I understand that. So the x cube predicted, is it, this represented by the second diagram? Like we have here in the slide? No, the second diagram just represents the, the uh, remember it tells us a series of two alternating least squares. Yeah. The one on the left is the first least squares, the one on the right is the second. Uh, so well, this is only for the first one. Yeah, this right. is for the first one. You can get a similar interpretation from looking at the second one. Because what's going to happen here is just the, the, the role of T and P are going to yeah, change. Yeah, that's yeah. Okay, so now for consensus PCA, I'm going to, can I erase this over here on the left? I just need a bit, a bit more space for this diagram. So I didn't draw this diagram because A, I ran out of time, and B, I think that uh, it's helpful for you to see where, where all the information is flowing in this particular instance. So consensus PCA works as follows. Let's take a block X. So here's our first block, x1 of data. And we're going to have another generic block, x superscript b in round brackets. And then our final block is x capital B. So this block over here has k subscript b columns. This block has k subscript lowercase b. And that block is K1 columns. So I'm going to go through the algorithm here. And as I said, what we're going to end up doing is we're going to calculate down here a super block or a super level model. So I'm going to just leave that generic there for now. And this first column over here, I'm going to call TA round brackets X. That's our super score. Okay. We're going to pick the super score as our starting initial guess. It's just going to be any, any column from any of our blocks. It doesn't matter which one you pick. So this is our super score. And what we're going to do is we're going to regress columns from X from each block onto that super score to <coughs> the block loadings. So we're going to, one way to draw this is to say, I'm going to regress this column. I'm going to take this column, regress it onto this column from XB to calculate my loadings here. P super B subscript A. Once I have that loading direction, I so in other words, what I do is I regress every column from this block onto this particular super score, and I calculate that entire loading vector. And in fact, what I'll do is I'll just do, I'll do that for each block in turn. So I'll also have P subscript A for the eighth component for the first block. And over here, I'll have P subscript A for my final block, capital B. And the formula for that regression is the same as, same as uh, we've seen before with ordering emails. So the, the, those loadings are just given by basically x transpose x inverse x transpose y. That denominator is my x transpose x inverse because 
the super score is taking the role of my x vector in the linear regression, and my y variables are the columns from block x v. And I'll normalize those, those loadings to unit length once I've calculated that. To calculate my block score, so what I'll do is I will use this loading, and both, because it's now of unit length, I can one way to interpret this equation, PA is of unit length. So I could have had a division here by PA transpose PA. So another way to interpret this equation is that my scores from the block are nothing more than the linear regression slopes when regressing rows from the block onto the block loadings. So it's the usual Niepel's regression where I'm going to take a row from X regress it onto the loadings and store those regression coefficients as the slopes in T subscript B for that block. And I'm going to repeat that for my C for this block. So T superscript B for that block and then T superscript 1 for this first block. So in other words, step three could be drawn as regressing this row from x onto that loading direction to calculate the corresponding slope coefficient. So that's step three. Oh, sorry, step four. That arrow over there. Step five then says, once I've calculated these individual scores for every block, copy and paste them down to this super level. So I'm going to call this T square brackets S. So the square brackets indicates I'm just assembling. I'm merely taking the score from the first block, the score from the second block, and so on up to the final block. Just copy and paste those down and assemble, in other words, a matrix over here, which is going to have <coughs> capital B columns and N rows. So step five then just says take, take each one of these and bring them down. Simply just copy and paste them and, and reassemble them into the super level. Okay, so this is really what uh, one, one terminology that's used for this super block is my, is my consensus block. It's, it's how all the blocks have a, some sort of consensus for bringing those scores down and copy them over there. So the, the interpretation of consensus should become clear uh, short, shortly. What we'll do next then is we're going to do a PCA round, a normal Niepels round, now between this matrix and the super score over here. So we're going to regress columns in the super score matrix. In other words, just the score from column one, the score from block two, the score from block capital B. We're going to re regress those score columns from the individual blocks onto the super score, TA, the super score S to get the super loadings. So, regressing columns if I take an A particular column here I'm going to regress this to calculate super loadings. square brackets superscript S for the A component. And this arrow, arrow corresponding to step six. Now I'll normalize that loading to unit length. We'll interpret what these mean in a minute. The reason why I want to go through this is 
So just see how the, the data is flowing and then we'll, we'll look at the interpretation in a minute. The final step then in the algorithm is to regress rows from the super score matrix onto the loadings. So we originated the loadings as our x variable in the linear regression. Take that as step eight. So we're regressing rows from the super scores onto the loadings. This takes the role of my y variable in the linear regression. That takes the role of my x variable to calculate back to where we started, back to our super score. And we'll cycle through these diagrams, uh, sorry, through these arrows until convergence. Okay. So it's nothing more than just taking the Nepal's algorithm and stringing it out through multiple blocks of, blocks of x. In fact, you can do this even just on a single block. Uh, it doesn't mean too much, but I mean, you, can, you just get back the ordinary PCA. But here what we're doing is we're just going through the Nepal's algorithm there's a, a, a whole round at the, soup, at the block level, and then we, we bring those scores down, and then we just do one new health iteration, so flip there, flip back, and we're back to our super scores. Then our, our upper level over here at the block level, we're regressing columns in X onto the super score, calculate the loadings, just do a, a single new health <coughs> round to get the, the block score, and then copy and paste those down. And, and The final step that we, we have to, to do is, let's assume we've converged now onto a particular set of scores. So every block will have its own scores, and the super scores will be calculated. The super loadings would have been converged, as well as the block loadings. Once that's happened, we need to do a, a deflation step. We need to deflate from every block the information we've just explained. So in the same way with Nepal's algorithm, we deflate after calculating a single component. We have to deflate, but we have to now deflate one, two, three, up to capital B block this time. And the choice of the column with, of which we deflate with is, uh, there's, there's two particular choices. I'm just going to introduce, uh, just talk about one particular choice here, the one that makes more sense. We're going to deflate from X the super score TA, uh, TA superscript S multiplied by the block loading. And that might seem a little unusual. Why don't we deflate from X the only block score? So instead of TA superscript S, why don't I deflate TA superscript B? So I'm taking the superscript score, always the same score, multiplying by the loading for the corresponding block, and then deflating that information. So there's two choices there. Um, when we come to PLS, I'll, the, the, the reason why we choose this, this uh, super score will make more sense. I'm not, for now, I don't want to get too much into those details. Other than, just to say what we're, what we're doing by taking the super score is that that's the block prediction the best prediction of x given the super score ta superscript s. And if we look back at tas, um, one way to, to see it, let's just go back up here to step eight, tas superscript s, that super score is called the consensus score for the following reason. The denominator here is, is usually one. It's only not one when you're missing data, but for, let's, let's say all our blocks are present, and so that denominator is one. So let's just focus on the numerator here. And remember the PA is being normalized to unit length, so the entries here tell us how much we weight the corresponding columns in TAS here, this accumulated matrix of scores one column for every block, the second column comes from the second block score, the final column comes from the final block. So those are the columns in capital T here. The P's represent by how much do we weight each one of these scores up. And so if our columns in capital T are very similar to each other, 
what will happen is in, in the knee pulse convergence is that the, the corresponding loadings for each of those columns will be roughly the same value. Okay? So if, if we've got four blocks and each of the blocks represents roughly the same sort of phenomena in the model, we'll have one quarter of the weight for, from the first block, one quarter of the weight from the next block, third block, and fourth block. That's one reason why it's called a consensus block. Another reason uh, why one can see this as being called a consensus block comes from uh, the original application was for judging foods or wines, let's say, where you had one block for every judge. So here's Jake, say, for example, is block one, and Yasser is block two, and Charlene is block three, and so on. Each of the judges have to rate the wines, the corresponding row in X, based on the same criteria, their perception of color, perception of taste, body. So those would be the corresponding columns from the X block. So Jake's corresponding ratings for the color, the taste, and the body, and so on, go over here. Charlene's in block two, the same columns, Yasser in block three, and so on. Then these scores, once calculated, represents a summary of all the, the columns for Jake, and all the columns for Charlene would be in the next block, and, and so on. We bring those corresponding scores, which summarize all their, their, pre their taste preferences for every row there, over here to this super block. So it's, it's, a, it's a consensus of the judges there. So if the corresponding weights for every one of these columns are roughly the same, it indicates we're getting roughly the same degree of information from every judge. But let's say Jake doesn't really know anything about wine and he's just knocking it back for the alcohol and just giving whatever scores he likes, what we'll find with an EPELS convergence is that it's going to give very low weight to Jake because he stands out as not following the same pattern as the rest of the judges. So the, the consensus of the bulk of the judges is going to be uniform, but it's going to pick out columns over here which are not that uniform, give it low weight because those, those don't match up to the super score over here. And so that's where that, that naming comes from, the consensus PCA. It's the consensus of, of the super of the sub-blocks and then how they, they come forward into the super limit. So the, the critical part here is the super loading, this, this loading over here. This tells us by how much each block is used in calculating this consensus score because uh, TA round bracket says is nothing more than taking these accumulated scores from the from the from the sub blocks and multiplying it by the corresponding loading here. Okay, so the relative weighting in, in P here in this in the super loading tells us how we weight up the corresponding scores from the from the from the other box. Okay, so as I said here, if we have a judge who behaves differently from the others or a block that behaves differently from the others, for that component, for the eighth component, its corresponding loading is going to be small. No different to Niepel's algorithm for a single PCA matrix. A column that has very different behavior from the others and has no consistency in that, in that component is going to get a small loading. Nothing's different here. It's just more complex with the number of blocks we have, but the interpretation is identical. So we'll deflate with the super score. It's going to remove that information that we've just explained by the super score. And one, one uh, outcome from that choice is that if we plot the block scores, so, so let's take block one as an example. We plot the block score from component one against component two for the first block, we're going to see non-orthogonal blocks there. The, the loadings are non-orthogonal as well. And you'll see that in the software. The hotelings ellipse is going to be sort of on its side or distorted uh, because of that non-orthogonality there. Okay. So that's the, that's the technical background and that explanation over there uh, goes into the details. But you'll be happy to know that the actual calculation itself is very, very simple. Uh, this comes back comes to this paper by Westerhouse, Kruti, and McGregor. They showed we don't need to calculate 
consensus PCA as we just described it. So previous work had gone through all this messy arrow pushing and in fact, there's a lot of bad journal publications with errors and there's algorithms out there that don't converge always prior to this work here from investor house because uh, as you can see, there's a lot of opportunities to make mistakes and uh, how you initialize the algorithm and normalize some of the choice of loadings you can get some algorithms that work and others that don't. So what, what uh, Vesterhaus showed is a much easier approach is just to pre-process your data for each block as you normally would. So take your data for block one, center and scale it to unit variance. Take your data for block two, center and scale it up until the final block. Once you've done all that centering and scaling, and you may have done some alternative pre-processing like nonlinear transformations, log scaling, and so on. You do that all up in your first step, and, and you get finished with that. Once done, come and take each block and divide it through by a scalar value, a different scalar value per block. Simply divide all the columns in, in your first block by the square root of the number of variables in that block. The second block, divide through by the square root of the variables, the number of variables in the second block up until the final block. Okay. Right? This looks exactly and is exactly like the concept of block scaling that we looked back a few weeks ago. Right? We said that if you've got these uneven uh, number of columns from certain groups of variables in your X matrix, we, we showed exactly this denominator here, using the square root of the number of variables in that block. So once you've done that and you've pushed all of these together, now you've created an, 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 an assembled an X matrix. You just do PCA on that X matrix. And what you'll find is that your scores from that PCA, so remember this PCA is just gonna give you a single matrix of scores, T. Those scores will in fact be the super scores over here. They'll be identical, so it will be T, subscript one for the first component, round brackets S, the second component, the third component. These scores over here for, at the super level will be identical to those PCA scores. Okay? And they'll have the same properties. T1 at the super level is orthogonal to T2 at the super level. T1 at the super level explains more variance than T2 at the super level. So all those properties carry forward. Okay. Once you have that super score, let's say for the first component, then all you do is you go back to step two, three, four, five, and six above to calculate the rest of the quantities. So in other words, you come back here to step two, we have our super score, okay? That's the ordinary, from, from that ordinary PCA, its scores are the super score, so let's take the first column, T1. We, can, we have the block values X, simply multiply, uh, calculate that and that, the corresponding loadings you calculate from that will be the block loadings. Normalize those to unit length, then calculate the block scores by saying XV's values times PA, the block loadings you just calculated, and divide through by the square root of KB. Okay. Now I must emphasize here that XV that you use over here, back here in step two, is not it is not XV divided by the square root of the K1. It's just the XV after doing this pre-processing step. So don't, don't do that additional uh, division over there. Just go take your raw data, pre-process it, and then come bring it in over here at this particular equation, point two, multiplied by those super scores divided by that, uh, that variance. Normalize to unit length, calculate your block scores, divide through there by KD. That's why, why we don't divide through by KD early on, because we're going to do it over here. Assemble your, your, your scores from each block, and then calculate your block loadings. And then, then you're finished. You don't need to do a cycle through this until convergence. Okay. So we can get all these quantities I've drawn here on the board by just doing an ordinary PCA. We'll get these super scores already converged and then just do one round through this diagram of arrows that I showed. Okay. That's why I did this. I did it for two reasons. One is, we're gonna to have to do this anyway, and we follow this shortcut approach 
given by Westerhaus. And secondly, if you understand this, or you do need to understand this, in order to interpret the loadings, the scores at the block level now in the software. When we go look now in the multivariate software, we're going to look at the block loadings, the block scores, we're going to look at the super scores over here, we're going to look at the super loadings. So in a, to understand those and, and interpret them, we need to understand how they might have been calculated. They weren't, in the software it does not calculate in this way. Okay, the software does use the shortcut approach. But to interpret them, we need to understand this, this diagram over here. So what we're going to do is I'll just introduce this case study and then uh, you can get started on it during the break and then we'll, we'll take a, a 10 minute break or so. So this is, this is the LDP case study we've looked at a few times now in this course. And what we'll do in today's uh, example is only look at the operational data. We're not going to look at the five Y variables. Remember there, there's the five Y variables like monomer, uh, short chain branching, long chain branching, number, molecular weight, uh, and so on. We're just going to look at how the LDPE reactor was operated. But we're going to block the variables from this operation into two blocks. We're going to have a block for the first zone of the reactor, and then a block for the second zone. Even though, that in this reactor, this, the material moves right through here, we're going to artificially block the, the variables from group one, and we're going to artificially block the variables in group two. And we're going to put the um, two variables are going to be in common with each block. The inlet temperature of the material and the pressure in the reactor, that inlet temperature and pressure are common to both zones. So the inlet temperature represents the inlet temperature of the material here in the first zone, as well as the inlet temperature in the second zone. It's the same inlet temperature. So that variable should be duplicated in both blocks. The pressure in the reactor is constant throughout, so again, it should be duplicated through both blocks. So I'd like you to, in, in, in the software, I'll show you now in a minute how to do it. We're going to create a two-block PCA or multi-block PCA with two blocks, zone one is data and zone two is data. And just using cross-validation to calculate A, uh, we're going to look at the scores for each block and the scores for the super block. We're going to look at the loadings for each block. We're going to examine the SPE for each block. This is one thing I, 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 I glossed over. Let's just come back over here uh, to this uh, super score. One thing to mention is, if we look at this deflation step, that quantity over there represents x hat. So x minus the super score multiplied by the, the, the blocks loadings. That TA superscript S, the super score multiplied by the block loads, that represents our best estimate of X for that component. That's X hat. So X minus X hat is our residual matrix. Uh, actually, yeah, there's a little error here. That should be X A plus one. In other words, that's the X matrix that goes on to be used in the A plus one component. So this is the deflation step. But the other way to interpret is x minus x hat is your residual matrix. Once you have your residual matrix, this is the residuals for that block x. We can go calculate the sum of squares with, along the rows and get an SPE value. In the same way we did with ordinary PCA. Take the sum of squares along the matrix and that gets us an SPE. So not only do we have a score column here for every block, we also have an SPE the first block. We also have an SPE for the eighth block and so on. We also have a T squared. All the usual tools that we have for a single block PCA we have now for, for each one of these blocks. Okay, so in the, in the exercise we're going to look at investigating the uh, square prediction error for each block as well as the square prediction error for the super block. The nice thing actually about this result, I can't emphasize enough how great this that, uh, that result from Westerhouse is because one thing to realize from a computational point of view is you can just go and use the usual PCA tools that we've learned, in other words, cross-validation. 
And because that Westerhouse paper proves that this big mess over here on the right is equivalent to ordinary PCA, all the usual tools that we've, we've come to use and, and understand are applicable. So cross-validation for multi-block, we don't need to do any extra theory to, to learn cross-validation for multi-block models because it's equivalent to cross-validation for PCA. Okay? Monitoring for multi-block models is, is similar. All those concepts from ordinary PCA apply to multi-block. Now, I don't think I've convinced you yet why all this complexity is actually useful, but um, we're going to look at that in a case study and hopefully that will become apparent. So let's take 10 minutes break. To